Hello there, fight friends. Today we are joined by Radley Da Silva. Radley is one half of the main event of BFL 79 this weekend in Vancouver. He'll be taking on Maxime Soucy and trying to steal his BFL featherweight title. Radley, how are you? Very good, very good. And sorry, I got to correct you there right off the bat. Uh, unfortunately, what? he actually isn't the unified champ, so he's actually Did I say unified? the unified belt as well. No, you said he's the featherweight champ. He's the interim champ. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, but, uh, okay. Yeah, a lot of people are confused because they've been they've been saying the same thing the whole, the whole time. They thought he was um, the champ, but he's actually just the interim champ. So he's fighting for the belt just like I am. Wow. Okay. Well, thank you for correcting me. Some people get upset when they're corrected, not me. <laughs> like I, I'd rather be right. So thank you. I appreciate it. Exactly. <clears throat> well, regardless, you are still fighting for a championship belt, so that's got to feel pretty good. This is what your fifth professional MMA fight. Yes, yeah, it's my fifth professional MMA fight, and it's the second time I'll be fighting for a professional title. I've been scheduled to fight for a professional title uh, actually two other times, so this was, I've had lots of five uh, five round camps. Let's just say. Oh boy, it seems like it's an epidemic these days where fights are just canceled for whatever reason. People get sick, they get injured, and the fight's just off. And I feel terrible for the fighters. You you put in all this time and this effort to train and get ready for something, and for it to just not happen, I mean, it's got to f- feel really terrible. Yeah, it, it is a bit of an epidemic, especially after the pandemic, <laughs> which was actually when, when I first won my first world title was uh, in 2009, the very end of 2009. So when I started uh, trying to schedule title defenses, it was just physically impossible. Like the pandemic yeah, yeah. happened literally like a few months after and you just could we couldn't get anything going. So, yeah. yeah. Well, before we go much farther into our talk, why don't you take a minute and just uh, for the people who don't know who you are, just say who you are and, and what you're about and, and what you do and where you're from and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. For uh, all the Canadian MMA fans that don't know me, uh, my name is Radley Snake Eyes of Silva uh, MMA fighter fighting in the featherweight division. Sometimes I fight in lightweight uh, if I can get a short notice fight. But I've been doing martial arts ever since I was five years old. Um, I was raised in the art of capoeira. So uh, my dad uh, was a master and my cousins and everyone, uh, everyone's born into capoeira. And I grew up watching them represent uh, our martial art in, in, uh, in, the, in the ring or the cage. So growing up as a little kid, I always, I always knew like I wanted to be in there representing uh, for our martial art just like them. And, uh, you know, eventually I was able to get in there, had my first amateur fight when I was 16 years old, Um, won that, had my first pro fight when I was 18 years old. And then I took a huge hiatus about six years off. And then in my first fight back after six years off, I fought right away for a for a world title, because that's how that's how much the community in Vancouver believes in me. And they uh, Mm -hmm. understand my skill level that I've been putting my whole life into into this uh, sport. So. Uh, I appreciate the respect uh, and uh, the, it's a big, big honor to represent the city at such a, you know, martial art. It has a lot of history, actually. People think Vancouver doesn't have many fighters, but there have been quite a few guys represent Vancouver in the UFC. And I'm just uh, trying to be uh, one of those guys coming up next. And you come from a great lineage, too. We spoke briefly before the interview about Axe Capoeira and some of the people that have represented that team in the past. Some really fantastic fighters like uh, Marcus Aurelio. Uh, he's probably the biggest name that came out of uh, Axe Capoeira. He's still fighting even recently. So it's it's got to be great to be able to represent that team and, and just put that name out there still in the public. Yeah, man, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a big burden sometimes, you know, because it's a big name to carry. Um, you know, people expect the flashiest thing. They, they expect a viral, a viral, something viral to happen every single time I step in there when you carry that flag. So it's, uh, it's an honor. And, um, yeah, I, lo- I look to just uh, make my family proud each time and carry the family name and move forward and really uh, carry it for the next generation because, you know, I have a lot of nephews and uh, a lot of young ones looking up to me and uh, – seeing me represent the martial art as well and they're probably going to be coming up next so i'm mm-hmm. uh, so it's such an honor to carry that flag for me one of the benefits to capoeira is that it can be an extremely devastating and effective technique or a set of techniques that's used especially when your opponents may have never trained really with anybody who can do that kind of stuff like capoeira it's so dynamic and with the spins and just the momentum that you can get in those kicks when you whip your whole body around. Do you think Maxim Susi is going to be ready for what you can bring to the table? 
Um, Maxim has been doing martial arts, like he's, I guess his whole life from what I've heard or what I've heard him say. So I don't expect him to be super flustered uh, with the kicks and all that. But at the end of the day, it's, it's more than, it's more than just kicks. It's a way of, it's a way of flowing. It's a way of movement. That's what really sets guys, um, it really it it uh, confuses guys. It's more the movement in there, like the yeah. the way I'm standing, the way I'm f- so free and loose, and uh, and I really have no restriction. I can throw a kick or a, uh, an attack from any position I'm at. And I feel that's what's the most uh, off-putting thing about fighting a cup with a fighter. I, I feel like people already know what to uh, to expect as far as like a certain kick. They already okay. He's gonna throw the mealua or or maybe a spinning round kick or something like that. Like you can, you can expect those type of things, but what you know, it's hard to be ready for is the way I'm, I'm, my body moves in there and how, how quickly I can get those attacks up uh, from different angles. And I attack from completely different angles than the conventional fighter. And part of what you just said, it's when you extend your body in some of the spinning kicks, you can travel a great distance in, in almost no time at all. So at one point you're on one side of the cage and two seconds later or half a second later, you're halfway across the cage with your foot in the guy's face. And some people just don't know how to respond to that speed. Yes, yeah, sir. And also I feel like um, people have this notion that just because uh, we can do a lot of flashy things and, you know, they see all the highlights that that we lack some sort of fundamentals or something mm-hmm. like of the sorts. But uh, for me, it's the contrary. I, I, like I said, I grew up in Capoeira, but since I was a teenager, I've been doing all the disciplines. I've been doing, you know, boxing, jiu-jitsu, kickboxing, Muay Thai, wrestling, especially. Uh, there was a certain point in my life where I actually stopped doing everything, including Capoeira, and focused only on wrestling for a few years. And, wow. you know, being an athlete, being a young being a young kid uh, and focusing just on one sport for a few years, it exponentially um, skyrocketed my, my uh, skill level in that. And that's why you see me have such a dominant wrestling base is because I really focused when I was a kid on every martial arts. So I'm not just a capoeira fighter. I'm definitely the new breed of capoeira fighters. And and from from here on, you you only expect to see guys uh, with that skill set of everything in capoeira, not just throwing fa- flashy kicks and, you know, flips and all that, but fully to fully have fundamentals in all the different disciplines is, is what the new breed of capoeira fighter is. That's really interesting to hear because as a, as a student of the fight game, I'm pretty well versed on the evolution of mixed martial arts, like how it's evolved from UFC 1 or even before that into what it is now where the fighters are so well-rounded. It only makes sense that like a, like a style of fight like Capoeira, it's, it's also evolved. It's done the same. So I don't really know, like I'm, I'm in the blind here, so I'm excited to kind of watch your fight and, and see what you mean by that because I can't even imagine it right now. Yeah, I mean, uh, basically, just I just mean that what what I take most from Capoeira is the ability to control my body in, um, a lot easier than the average person. You know what I mean? Like, to be able to, like I said, attack from certain angles that most people can't, to be able to get myself out of positions in ways that people aren't expecting. And I think that's what I take most of Capoeira is the body control. Because when I, when I, when I grew up in Capoeira and that was my base, I basically could, uh, could do any discipline and pick it up extremely fast and excel in it right away because I had such good body control and was so aware of uh, h- how to move myself and, and all those things. So I think that's what I, what I feel like is one, why it's one of the best bases for MMA is because I can go into any other sport and right away be – picking things up like instantly and um and i feel like that's why it's one of the best bases personally i know wrestling everyone everyone knows wrestling is a great base jiu-jitsu is a great base but even in wrestling when i was doing wrestling they would have me doing a lot of like acrobatics and things that i already had been doing my whole life um to warm to to be able to be a better wrestler so coming in with that already i was able to be a good wrestler right off the bat and have great success in any any discipline that i tried Wow, that's fantastic. Who is going to be in your corner at this weekend? Um, I'm going to have my teammates, um, Achilles Estremadura. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm sure you've heard of him. Of course. 100%. And uh, Jamie Siraj, I'm sure you've heard of 100%. Yeah, the gremlin, yep. And, uh, yep. and Dennis Kang, I'm sure you've heard of oh. 100%. So Dennis Kang all is big names school. Yep. Well, my, yeah, as well, my family member, Marcus Aurelio, he'll be there as well. So, um, oh. you know, all guys oh. that have been there since day one for me, like 
you know, my Achilles, like me and he literally started uh, training MMA with my family in Capoeira. Um, and, you know, he excelled on to, you know, learn all the other disciplines. But that that's I, I'm I'm riding with guys that I've known since I was like a little kid. He, Jamie, even Jamie Siraj, like me and him have known each other since we were kids. We even grappled each other in uh, in like wow. uh, in those regional wow. MMA shows when we were like 14, 15. We've known Holy him. Moly. So it's just guys that I'm super comfortable with, guys that are in there day in, day out with me. Of course, Dennis Kang, legend, legend of the game. Like he's so, uh, shown me so much stuff on the ground. Um uh, as as um, as I am kind of a, a ground based, uh, I personally I, I like the ground a uh, ground game a lot more. Like I said, I stopped doing capoeira and every like I'm a I've been an athlete my whole life doing all sorts of different sports since I was a little kid and I stopped everything just to focus on wrestling when I was a teenager for a few mm-hmm. years and it really gave me that base of wrestling that you you can't really teach when you're older. So mm-hmm. having that base of wrestling and ground game, a guy like Dennis Kang, he's like the perfect match, um, perfect coach for my kind of style. He, he has a, he had a devastating ground game when he was uh, coming up in Pride and all that. So mm-hmm. it really complements my game. And I'm just so confident with my corner behind me and uh, my team. Well, Dennis Kang came from that era along with George St. Pierre where they were sort of the hybrid fighters where they weren't just a striker, they weren't just a grappler, they could do it all. And to see yeah. where where he has come from, and I think he's got his own gym now right in Vancouver. And, uh, you know, it's really cool to see that he's at a point now where he's helping to train the young up-and-comers like you and, and lead you to success in the future. Yeah, the, I mean, we really need guys like that. You know, a lot of the times fighters, uh, they'll go, you know, they're too injured or they they get sick of the game because they've been in it for so long. But, you know, Dennis is like, he's a true He's a true martial artist, and, you know, he, this is what he does. is what he loves. So he, he's in there, you know, every, every MMA. He, I do all my MMA with him. Uh, he's my main MMA coach, and it's given me a lot of confidence in, in this matchup for sure. I want also, you to visit- being that he trained at – I'm sorry. I was just going to say, also being that yeah. he trained at TriStar for a long time, so he kind of yeah. understands their style. And um, sure. same with Jamie Shiraz. spent spent a lot of time at TriStar as well. So, you know, we understand uh, the kind of style they're bringing in. We take it very seriously. You know, uh, he's coming from a very good team. Like, all respect to Faraz and and those guys at TriStar. And, uh, yeah, we're we're taking it seriously and uh, we're coming to win. Do you train at TriStar Vancouver at all? Um, I have gone there. I have cross trained there. Like, I, like I'm very lucky. I've never, I've never been in a situation where it's like, oh, I have to train at one place. And that's also why I feel so, um, so honored. I feel like I'm, I'm kind of, this belt's kind of for the city because I, I'm telling you, I train everywhere in the city and the city really comes together for me. Like I can go anywhere. I can go to Universal. I can go to CQMA. I can go to WKX. I, I'm at Pinnacle, you know, I've gone TriStar even, even just before I started this camp, I was actually uh, at tri- West Coast TriStar for uh, just going into their j- jiu-jitsu class when you know what I mean because Jamie Siraj is also uh, very connected with uh, Cajun Johnston the head coach there so whenever you know I go to Revo- I'm going to Revolution uh, every like whenever Jamie calls me down he teaches there so I'm literally everywhere getting work with all sorts of different guys everyone in the city knows me uh, they know what I'm capable of and I feel like the whole city is coming together for this one so well now after this interview it's going to be everyone in Canada is going to know who you are <laughs> yeah, hopefully, man. That's what I'm. That's why I'm uh, throwing myself in the lines. Then that's why I'm going right into the fire, um, trying to get my name known as quick as possible. I'm not trying to take, you know, warm up fights, feeler fights. Yeah, like I said, like I came off a six year hiatus right into a title fight against a guy who was undefeated and like touted as a big prospect and uh, and John Nguyen. I don't know if you've heard of him. He was the unified of champion just yep. recently. Yep, he just fought. And, uh, yeah. I, Fought him after a six-year layoff, took him out, and then I had another three-year layoff after that fight, and right away fought a guy, Mike McAloon, uh, up a weight class, a guy who took out some good names like John Nguyen and Johnny Broad himself, so he had eight fights, I, got, I had like three fights going into that, so, and I, you know, I'm, I, I made that look pretty easy, I, I feel, and I don't even feel like I performed to my ability, uh, to tell you the truth, because I had I had a newborn baby um, right in the middle of that camp, so it was wow. uh, it was a lot to deal with. But it, I wasn't I wasn't gonna nothing was gonna stop me from showing up that night, and um, it's been the same, man. Ever since that night, uh, ever since that last fight, I've been trying to get fights right away. As soon as I as soon as I left the arena that night, I was already looking for another fight, and I was actually able to schedule one, and I was supposed to fight in uh, December. Um, 
uh, this December, I was supposed to fight. And one week before the event, uh, the samurai event, I was supposed to fight and the whole event got canceled. So uh, unfortunately I yeah. didn't get to fight yeah. December, but I got, I got, um, uh, contacted about this opportunity and I feel like it's a much better opportunity. I almost feel like the universe said, you know what, <laughs> you, you've been putting in a lot of work. You deserve this opportunity, and it gave me a, a, a opportunity that I've been asking for for a long time. You know, to be champion of Battlefield uh, in my natural weight class against a guy who I personally feel is a very good stylistic matchup for myself, who likes to strike on the outside like I do, who likes to use kicks, who likes to uh, be methodical about his strikes, who's not—he's not much of a power puncher at all. You know, his mo his most dangerous um, weapons are his kicks and maybe some step in elbows, but nonetheless, I feel like just that style in general, it uh, complements my style so well on the feet, and then on the ground, I mean, I, I, I just feel like it's a good matchup on the ground, like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna bad talk his ground game, yep. or anything like that, but um, it's it's just a very good, it's a very good matchup for me, and uh, you, I just want to say, you never really want to be the guy who's uh, undersized going up against the better wrestler, that's just a nightmare matchup mm -hmm. to be in in MMA, so. I'll just leave it at that, and uh, it's a very good matchup, and I'm very happy with it. When you talk about your fight career and how you've had multiple, you know, many-year layoffs in between fights, your last fight against Mike, I think, was October, so what, four months ago, and you wanted to fight right away. Where are you right now in your mindset with your career? Is this something you want to focus and do often, or is it, is it just like every couple of years you're going to go in there and, and, you know, throw your hat in the ring? Yeah. Yeah, no, it's definitely it's a fair question because, uh, as you, like, I've had so many layoffs, but I feel like, honestly, all those layoffs is just, it's just I feel like the universe doesn't put me in a situation unless it feels like I'm 100% ready for whatever reason, even if I feel like I am ready to go. Like, I even took a short notice fight against Mateo Vogel and uh, for the featherweight title at Battlefield, like, last year, and I was fully ready to go. I, I had cut weight and everything, and the fight was about 10 days away, and again, the whole event got canceled. Like, yep. Yep. it's just things that are out of my hand, and I feel like it's not up to me sometimes, you know? It, it, you just got to really let go of those things. Like, sometimes if you force it, it's, you're just going to end up, like, you know, burning out or wasting your energy. Like, I know if I... If I yeah, I know if I get there that night, that's where I'm meant to be, and that's where I'm supposed to be. So there's no need to – there's no need to stress out because it does get very stressful. I'll tell you right now, I've been in training camp since exactly last year, January. I've had countless fights scheduled, and then weeks go by. No, they didn't sign the contract, or no, it's, it, it, we didn't get the opponent. I've literally been in fight camp since last year, January, training hard with my whole team, cutting weight sometimes because thinking I have an opponent all all year long. And then after the uh, June 8th card that happened when the UFC was here for Battlefield, I was I was very close to getting a fight for that as well. Um, a guy pulled out in my weight class, didn't have an opponent. I offered to step in. He didn't accept it. And uh, at that point, I kind of said, okay, I'm, I've been forcing it for six months straight. It's not happening. Let me let me reel back a little bit, recover, because it, it, it's grueling to do a six-month training camp. So mm -hmm. I was able to reel back, recover a little bit, and then I got the call for the Mike McAloon fight. Um, my daughter was being born at the time, so it was a short, it was a short training camp. But... Nonetheless, we, we went in there, we got the job done, and uh, I've been just la laser-focused ever since, man. And uh, now I get this opportunity, and thank God. I think you're doing the right thing because, in my experience, the happiest people are the ones who understand that they can't control everything, and so there's no, set, no, there's no point in being upset about stuff you can't control. All you can do is just keep training, stay in the gym, improve your skill set, be ready, so when the time comes for whatever the universe throws at you, you'll be ready for it. Yeah, exactly that. I mean, just because I've taken a long hiatus from being in the cage, that doesn't mean I've ever stopped training. Yeah, I've yeah. never stopped training. It's my it's my lifestyle. I don't know anything else. So I'm just I'm just happy to be focused. And the goal the goal is to make it to the UFC. And I want to I want by this the end of this year for the UFC to be on the radar of signing me for the contender series. So I want to I want to mm -hmm. get two fights, three fights in, maybe be five, six, and one by the time the contender series rolls around. And then I do have you know, maybe a say in putting my hat, uh, my name in there to get signed for the contender series uh, by the end of this year. Awesome. 
Well, it sounds like a plan, but the first step in that plan is this weekend against Maxime. So uh, that's all the questions I have for you right now, Radley. It was a really ple- it was a pleasure speaking with you. I, I really enjoyed talking about the history of Axe Capoeira as well before we even uh, started the talk. So, uh, yeah, is there anything else you'd like to say? Anything else I, I should have asked or anything else you'd like to say? Um, no, nothing you should ask. I'm not going to do your job for you, obviously, but uh, I appreciate the time <laughs> and, you know, it's a it's a wonderful thing to be able to give these uh, uh, these local fighters like a platform to be able to speak and you know introduce themselves to the to Canada and you know who else whoever else may be watching. But I really appreciate uh, the t- uh, you taking the time to let me speak and you know tell a little bit about myself. So thanks so much for that. Well, thank you so much. I I appreciate being appreciated. So there you go. All right, there you go. <laughs> it's not just the fighters, right? You guys, you guys are, are half the half the job. You know, if a tree falls in the woods and no one's there to see it, did it even fall? <laughs> I don't know. We can maybe uh, schedule a, a trip to the woods to figure that out someday. But uh, <laughs> until, until then, Radley, thank you again for speaking with us. Best of luck this weekend, or I guess the Thursday against Maxime Susi at BFL seventy nine. Appreciate it, man. Thank you so much. <laughs>